Okay, I'd like to call the Cape Elizabeth Town Council meeting of March 11th to order. And I'd ask the town clerk to take roll call, please. Chairman Walsh? Here. Councilor Guvenelli? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Ray? Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Wagner? Okay, well, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The Pledge of Allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, town council reports and correspondence. Seeing or hearing none, we'll move on to the monthly financial update, and I believe that was included in your packet. I don't know whether, Frank, you wanted to make a comment. We do have a finance committee meeting today as well. Do you want to focus sure. on that? Sure. Um, not really on the financial update uh, as much as just I thought monthly we could um, address a particular topic that's related to finance to, to better inform and, uh, folks and to, um, and to focus on particular issues that might uh, raise um, questions or interest. And so um, two things I wanted to highlight today very quickly is one is just the, uh, the um, debt profile of the town and school together. Um, and I've got a graphic which, which I can distribute to the council and we can put it up on the web. And the other one is just, just to briefly summarize the budget, summer, budget schedule. So um, great, thank you. Just distribute this. And this will be more meaningful uh, to the folks who are watching when they're able to actually look at this. Um, and what I just wanted to do, because there's a lot of questions we've had recently, and certainly in a broader scope, on the uh, debt uh, situation for uh, town, and people are talking about it a lot as it relates to the country overall. And what this graphic represents is information that's been publicly available. I just put it in a different kind of format. Uh, basically, that as we look out to over the next several number of years, the existing debt on the books of Cape Elizabeth, uh, which includes both the municipal and the town, the municipal and the school, um, has a fairly rapid decline profile that is built into our uh, budget forecasts. Um, by June of this year, the outstanding debt obligations for the town and school will be about $19 million. And over the ensuing five years, they'll be cut more than in half. So as we think about the capital requirements of the combined entities in our town, uh, in our mind, we should be thinking about the fact that, indeed, uh, there is debt capacity and the ability to uh, satisfy capital needs, both in the town and the school. And we know that that's going to be a requirement <coughs> in terms of just maintaining the roads, the infrastructure here, the schools have their requirements. and. Um, and we're in a good position to be able to address those needs as time goes on. So this, this will give us some insight as people look at it. And certainly, we're available to uh, answer questions as it relates to it. Any comments before we move on? Anybody? It's a um, great, great graph. Thank you. Um, as I said, the information has been publicly available. This is not new. Um, and just as a, as a um, heads up as it relates to the process of the town council on uh, the budget review, uh, this evening, we'll be reviewing uh, the budget accounts for public works, parks and recreation, and special funds. Uh, on Thursday night, we'll be reviewing the general government expenditures, public safety, human resources, library, and facilities. So it's, if there's an interest uh, in the community to participate in this or uh, observe what's going on, <coughs> that will be part of our process. And then very importantly, um, budget uh, public comments will be available, uh, can be made on the meetings of April 8th, um, uh, which is the regular town council meeting, as well as uh, April 11th, which will be the wrap up, oh, excuse me, the wrap up, and we'll set the budget for public hearing then as well. Uh, and then finally, there'll be, there'll be public hearing with the combined um, budgets on April 29th. And again, all this information is on the web, um, all the dates. Thank you, Frank. Any questions for Frank? Okay, so we move to the next item on our agenda, which is this first opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on the agenda. And seeing no one in the chamber, we will move on from there to the town manager's report. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to make mention the council had a workshop. Uh, we, I think I get confused time. Last week sometime, amongst other things, <coughs> talked about the Thomas Jordan Trust. And the Thomas Jordan Trust helps those in the community who are at 150% of the federal poverty level or below. And one of the, one of the programs that the Thomas Jordan Trust has <coughs> funded this year, and it, the board is made up of the council members, uh, is a fund to help families with, if, they ha if they're having trouble with their fuel bills. Uh, there is still money left in that account so if there is someone at home that, you know, is running out of fuel, uh, is worried about fuel, you know, we're getting to the end of the winter, but still uh, the, there are still heating bills, uh, they, they should call in uh, the town office and uh, ask to speak to Deborah Lane, and she'll have them uh, meet with the appropriate person about possibly getting some um, assistance with their fuel bills. Uh, if you, you look at the website uh, on that, if you, uh, there is an area that, that describes the Thomas Jordan Trust uh, that, that helps pay for those. And uh, anyway, encourage someone if they're really struggling and they're at 150 percent of the federal poverty level or, or uh, below uh, to make sure they let us know if they need. So, thank you. Michael, um, the, uh, did the Sprague family sign an agreement or anything? Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, update you on that, Jim. Uh, I, I did discuss it with Will Harris today, uh, who's the, the uh, head of the state park system. Uh, yeah, they, they were very happy. The uh, uh, state park directors of the Department of Conservation worked with the governor's office and worked with the uh, uh, Sprague Corporation, particularly Seth Sprague and Jeanette Hagen, uh, to have a five-year agreement uh, protecting uh, for public use uh, 100 acres of the park, including uh, the entrance, uh, the uh, state, uh, you know, worked on, the governor didn't sign the bill, he let it become law, uh, you know, without his signature, uh, 10 days, you know, after it passed, but, but, but I wanted, the governor's office was very helpful, you know, through the process and in getting it to there, and, you know, obviously we've read in the, news, the newspaper, there's other reasons he's not signing bills or whatever, but uh, he, he did uh, have this go through. And, you know, we're very appreciative of that. And, uh, you know, it, Will said today that, you know, the longer term, they're looking at, uh, you know, possibly uh, working with uh, private sector groups to do uh, some fundraising in order to purchase the full interest in the state park. So uh, that, uh, you know, this is something interesting to follow. But, uh, you know, it's a really great example of cooperation <coughs> uh, between the Spray Corporation and the state of Maine, and uh, appreciate all the reps. I also want to particularly thank the role of our legislators. Uh, there was some legislation that was necessary in order not to have all the monies go to the general fund and for the state park system to be able to retain some money that would help pay the lease. It's reported, I haven't seen the lease, but it's reported in the newspapers, $100,000 a year. And, you know, that, uh, that was, you know, some good work and cooperation done by our legislators. I also want to cite Jane Eberly, who's no longer a legislator, but mm -hmm. particularly last summer as this issue was evolving. Uh, she could not have been more helpful in, in bringing parties together and encouraging dialogue and discussion. So uh, it's, it's good to see, and uh, you know, this is 2013 and until 2018. Uh, there, there aren't major issues. So. Very good. good. Any questions for the manager? <coughs> That's good. Okay, well, let's move to our reviewing minutes. We have uh, two sets of minutes to consider tonight. Uh, the first set of minutes is February 11th, 2013. Do I see a motion? I'll move to approve. Do I hear a second? Second by Frank. All those in favor of approving the minutes of February 11th? See unanimous. Second set of minutes to be approved is the minutes of March 4th, 2013. Move to approve. Moved by David, seconded by Jessica. All those in favor of uh, accepting March 4th's minutes? All those in favor, it's unanimous, thank you. First order of business tonight is a public hearing for the proposed amendment to the boards and commissions ordinance. And that would be item number 43, 2013. Um, I don't know, Michael, did you want to introduce this just briefly? Um, we, for, yeah. for the folks at home? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, the Community <coughs> Services Advisory Commission was established in 1977, and when it was established, it was 
with uh, representation from both appointed by the town council and both by the school board. It took the place of the old summer rec programs. There was a there was a park and recreation commission back then, and but it picked up adult ed. You know all the programs eventually the community service is known for. As it's evolved over the years, community services has become more and more under the responsibility of the superintendent. All the employees report to the superintendent, and in keeping with the 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 structure of oversight of educational programs, it's really much more appropriate that the Community Services Advisory Commission not have the joint responsibility to, to both groups. It's, it's not in keeping with the independence of uh, school departments uh, hmm. in the main statute. So this proposal would simply remove the Community Services Advisory Commission from within the town code <coughs> ordinances, uh, which then it would devolve to uh, the school department. Uh, you know, can just be, have full control of the school board in terms of uh, the membership on the commission and its responsibilities. Okay, I'll open up a public hearing. Seeing no one in the audience to talk with us about this, I will close the public hearing and the chair will entertain a motion on item number 43, 2013. Anyone want to propose? <laughs> David is the official uh, uh, the movement tonight, I suppose. <laughs> uh, I move that we approve the proposed amendment to the boards and commissions ordinance as described in our materials this evening. You see a second? Seconded by Frank. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, we move to the second item on our agenda, which is a public hearing as well on amendment number two to the boards and commissions ordinance and that's item number 44 2013 Michael is there anything to add to what you've already stated no okay so this <laughs> <laughs> short and sweet okay I'd low open the public hearing for proposed amendment number two to the boards and commissions ordinance Seeing no one in the audience to talk with us about that, I'd close that public hearing. And I look to uh, town council for a motion. But let's, let's see if we can get someone on this I'm side happy. to move this one. Yeah. Oh, Jamie, go. good, thank you. Jamie, well, go ahead. <laughs> I propose that we accept the item 44-2013. Okay, can we give you a second it? Caitlin, we have a second from Caitlin. Okay, we're going to get everybody involved here this, this evening. Okay, all those in favor of the proposed board and commission's ordinance amendment. Okay, unanimous. Now we move to item number 45, which is a budget referral. It's recommended to refer the proposed municipal and general fund budgets of fiscal 2014 to the Finance Committee to the, and to the request that the Finance Committee review the proposed school budget upon its receipt from the school board. I have a motion for that budget referral. Jessica? Yep, I move we approve uh, item 45, 2013. Seconded. Second. Dave, Dave, Dave seconds. All those in favor of the budget referral? Unanimous. Number 46, which is Fort Williams Park Group Use Request for the American Cancer Society. <clears throat> this has been reviewed by the uh, Fort Williams Advisory. And I don't know, Michael, if there's anything you wanted to add to it. It's pretty straightforward. It looks like it'll be a very good event for a very good cause. Yeah, and uh, there's been lots of good correspondence back and forth with uh, Bob Malley and this, the representatives of this group who are a couple of uh, local residents as well so I think it's uh, it's uh, it'll be a good use of the, the park and um, again it, it's in October so yeah and, and, and there is one point if you look at the, the final <coughs> just before the next <coughs> item number mm -hmm. uh, they've indicated they have very limited funds for this event and asked that if possible some of all the applicable fees for park use be waived and I think what they're asking is not that any of our out-of-pocket, they would reimburse all our out-of-pocket expenses, mm -hmm. but they're asking, you know, that we would not put an extra fee on it for, mm -hmm. for uh, use of the park. And, and this is not that unusual because most of the use of the, the, the walk is outside the park. They're just using it as a, as a destination yep. uh, end point. Good. Chair, will entertain him. Uh, Jessica. Yeah, I just, I mean, I think it's a, uh, a great event, but I just had a couple of questions. It, uh, have we had this sort of thing before and waive fees? They want that picnic area. 
Um, have we waived yeah. fees in the if, past? If, I mean, are you just concerned about pre yeah. precedent setting if that's... We would not waive the fee for the use of the, the picnic shelter. Okay. We, we would waive the, the other field use uh, fees. Uh, we, we've had a lot of similar walks over the years. Uh, you know, there, there used to be a, actually a lot more of them. They have, we haven't had as many in recent years, maybe the economy, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and some of the other, the, the, there's been a couple of other major events that swim walk thing they do in South Portland and others. So, you know, the, the American Cancer Society is trying to get this one going again. Yes. Just along that same vein, I mean, to differentiate this event, say, from the beach to beacon, the use is not as intensive. It doesn't monopolize such a large portion of the park as the beach to beacon or other. I, I think it's very good that you asked that question because I'm sure other people might ask that same question. You know, with, with all these types of activities, <coughs> including beach to beacon, they didn't pay a fee for many years. Uh, you know, if, if it is found that, you know, this becomes a continuing event and it does have a major impact on the, the park, obviously they would want to be revisited in a succeeding year. Uh, but, uh, you know, all of these groups, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission has looked at over the years on, on a scale of is it people intensive, is it traffic intensive, does it interrupt others' enjoyment of the park? And this one, you know, it's, uh, there are quite a few cars involved, uh, but it's, uh, you know, is you know a lot of the event is outside the park. So, you know, as is the beach to beacon. But, you know, I if, if this became anywhere near the size of beach to beacon, I think there'd be a, uh, you know, a, a quick reexamination of the fee structure. Any other questions, Jeff Frank? They indicate that they um, they need parking for 650 50. or 700 cars. Does that mean they'll be on the grass and areas that's not normally for parking? Yeah, well, most of the parking we put up near the old fire station, up on up in that area, it's out of the way, and very little impact. Well, essentially, the same place you put family fun day. Family fun day parking, and yeah, you know, we used to have the symphony there and other things. Any other questions? Yeah, Jamie. Yeah, I, as long as uh, I'd be interested to hear what Michael says, but as long as all these types of groups are treated in a similar fashion, that would be I, similar to what Jessica said. That would be my only concern that there's some. This for the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, as yeah. they look at every yep. request, and similarly, similar groups, nonprofits are treated similarly. Yeah. You know, the, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission has done a really good job of raising revenue in, in the park over the last few years as a result of these different fees. And you know, I, I, I think I think this discussion has really been helpful because I think it's very cautionary that you know that you know maybe we might do this on a one-time basis. Uh, but uh, they shouldn't expect it on, a, on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? So I will entertain a motion then on item 46. Jessica? I move that we approve the uh, uh, request from the American Cancer Society, item number 46, 2013. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? We happen to have the chair of the Fort William Advisory Commission present in the room if anyone wanted to direct questions to Mr. Brunell. But uh, could, could go ahead briefly. Go ahead. Yeah, Bill, what we just had was a bit of a colloquy uh, about the, the issue of they had asked for a waiver of the fee this first time. And we, we, we just had a discussion, the council had some really good discussions that, you know, they'd pay the picnic shelter fee, they'd pay all our out pocket expenses that this first time we wouldn't charge the out-of-pocket, we wouldn't charge another use fee for them, but that they shouldn't expect that that would be the case in the future. When we met with them, they were quite willing to, uh, to pay the use fee. Yeah. And uh, we, we thought, we all agreed that the, that the $5 per head uh, fee would be outrageously. And they will pay for the shelter and all of our out-of-pocket expenses. Good. Okay. Any uh, further comments? Okay. I'm going to take a vote then. All those in favor? It is unanimous. Okay. Moving on to number of item 47, tobacco use. The Personnel Advisory Committee made up by representatives of every municipal department is recommending a proposed change to the personnel code to extend our smoking policy to apply to all tobacco products. The specific concern is the use of chewing tobacco. 
So what you have here is a an update to the advisory. This is a, an ordinance, or is this town it's, policy? It's what the is personnel it? code. Personnel code. It's section three one eighteen. Do I see a motion? I'd like to ask a question. Well, why don't we move it, second it, and then we'll have a question. Okay. We could. So move, would you could you move it? Sure. Propose, uh, propose that we uh, adopt section 3118 as uh, listed in our um, personnel code. Personnel code. Okay. Seconded. Okay. Jessica. Jamie, question. Yeah. Uh, what's, if, if this is targeted <coughs> towards chewing tobacco, what's, what's the concern here? Why is the town getting involved? This is only chewing tobacco by employees. It's in the personnel code. Only by employees and only in municipal buildings and in municipal vehicles. The concern is, is that there's been a number of municipal employees who have been chewing tobacco in the presence <coughs> in vehicles and others and other employees when they were in those, then go into those vehicles, find it, it, it uh, very disturbing. And they'd like us, and this is coming from the employees themselves, uh, is they would like us to, to ban the use of, they have all sorts of nicknames for chewing tobacco, uh, basically uh, for reasons of sanitary issues. <coughs> and, uh, you know, pe the people just are offended by, cap by tobacco products at this time of, of all types. But it, it, but it has no limitation on anyone, you know, being on municipal property in their own cars. They can do whatever they want. Uh, this is only municipal vehicles and around the entrances to uh, municipal properties in, in, in municipal buildings. So, if in, Frank, in the second line, it says employees. for its employees and visitors to municipal facilities. What is that? How does that impact visitors? Uh, we, we, would, we would politely say to people, you know, but the, the reality is, is, you know, people don't come into this building without just chewing tobacco. It's never been a, no. Well, I don't know that that's true. Some people might come into the building with tobacco in their mouth, but they're not going to spit on the floor. Yeah. So, I mean, it, to have a prohibition against something that doesn't have a second-hand effect on the public unless they are spitting on the floor, I think, might be a, a bit of a, a stretch of what we need to be involved with. Yeah. Um, you know, it's... Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, David. Well, I mean, having gone to a southern university, a lot of people uh, chew tobacco, and, uh, and I remember it was sort of a vile habit because people would be spitting in cups and the cups would be on the floor and then they get knocked over, you know, being inadvertent. But is, is that the issue that tobacco is getting, you know, chewed tobacco is getting spilled in vehicles and in buildings and causing a mess or causing odor? Is that sort of the problem? That's what I heard. You know, I haven't had that personal exposure, <laughs> but that is what the employees of the personnel, they, they've discussed this three different times. And, you know, they, they want it stopped. They, I think your word vile uh, is a word I've heard at the, at the meetings. It's, uh, they think it's a filthy, vile hab habit, and they resent other employees doing it. So, In a way that would affect their work day. In a, in a way that affects the, their, their ability to go into a municipal vehicle and, and uh, you know, not be, not be impacted by, uh, and I want to say that, you know, our there are some employees who are disrespectful of others, but, you know, it, it was a significant enough issue that, you know, they, they've, they've asked me three times to, couldn't the council adopt a prohibition? Did you have a question, Jessica? Well, I was just going to add, and it's, it's a, not the same issue to, to uh, Council Wagner's point, but um, thinking in medical terms and thinking of OSHA, uh, Occupational Self uh, Safety and Health Administration, bodily fluids of various kinds are considered to be very risky items. And so I think that just besides the fact of, you know, <coughs> socially, uh, Unpopular. I think that spitting in general is something that is um, to be avoided, and I think this is an extremely reasonable uh, motion. Just if I, if I might to, to Jamie's question, <coughs> if someone violates the personnel code, an employee is subject to disciplinary action. If a visitor did it, th there's nothing in the personnel code that allows us to summons or to do anything with a visitor. This is more a matter of we, we, would, we would tell them we have a policy that you're not allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's no, there's no sanction, there's no 
but not going to take action against any visitor other than asking them to refrain. Uh, my question is, does it have to be um, on a, a change in the code, the personnel code? I mean, you know, just, just plain working relationships with people, respectful relationships and a great place to work, whatever, you would think you wouldn't have to get to the point where you have to put it in writing. But because we're dealing with various work groups, it needs to be referred to in the policy. That's, you know, when, when you're telling, I think particularly because we already addressed smoking, it's just, it's just, an, just extension, an extension of the it's an extension of that same area. Yeah. Okay, just curious, that's all. And, and Mike said they are requested three times, so obviously, hmm. you know, when it got brought up the first time, fellow employees didn't get the hint. Yeah. Three strikes in your hand. It's so a public works issue or a fire department issue, Bob? We have a policy about three fire strikes department. here, oh, don't we? It's a property policy. Yeah. Yeah. It's more of an issue in fire trucks and fire okay. All right. Uh, Jamie again. The, the last sentence of that said um, employees may use their regular breaks for smoking yep. and not entitled to additional breaks. So, so are we telling them they can only smoke during their break now or can they chew? We, we, we're not <laughs> regulating chew on at all on private in their vehicles or any of that. If, you know, if they're on their break and they're out of a building or whatever, that's not a concern or a fear. But the only reason that sentence is in there is that when, when all the smoking bans came in, some employees had an expectation was, well, you're telling me I can't smoke anymore. You need to give me additional breaks to smoke. I, I, uh, I, I which, just think you know, we, we wanted to make clear that we don't do that. Why did we change all the other references to smoke except for that last one? Shouldn't it be employees tobacco. may use their regular breaks for tobacco use? You know, if you, if you think that's necessary, it goes back to the that's what I'm saying. If that's you what think it's necessary, that's fine. It's, this, right. it's, uh, it just makes it more yeah. uniform through the whole. It does. Yeah. Okay, so that's a suggestion. So the motion was made by. Frank, would you be would you accept that uh, modification or to yes, the? Yes, that's fine. Okay, and it's tobacco use, right? right? That's what you're suggesting. And the person who seconded, are you okay with that, Jessica? Yes. You are okay. So we have a amended recommendation in front of us. Any further discussion on this? Okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Moving on to item 48, definition of normal high water line of coastal waters. Our new code enforcement officer has um, made a recommendation and the request in front of us is to refer this to the um, planning board. Entertain a motion. David. Uh, I move that we refer to the planning board uh, the request of the code enforcement officer regarding the definition of normal high water line of coastal waters. Seconded. Anyone? Second. Second by Jamie. Uh, any discussion around this, Michael? Anything for background? I just like to, this is an extremely important issue, and I, I applaud the code enforcement officer for uh, bringing it forward. Uh, we're, we're involved in some <coughs> litigation now on this issue. Uh, there's, there's definitely, it would help to have some policy direction. It, if, it, it would constitute, if there are any changes of recommendation to amend this, it would, would affect the zoning ordinance. That requires a referral to the planning board. That's why it's recommended to go there. But, uh, you know, we're, we're continuing to spend a lot of legal fees defending, uh, you know, issues involving uh, this very definition. And it, we really haven't looked at it since, uh, 1982 or three, so it you know it's just a good time to have a review. Okay. Any further comments? Yes, Jamie. Yeah, Michael. In what context does it generally come up? Uh, the use of that in our ordinance. It it comes up with um, the, if you're trying to build within the shoreline, you need a setback from the normal high water line. Uh, we define the, the, the normal high water line as the, the, effect of, the effect of the tides on the top of the bank, on the, on the bank. And that definition, to our knowledge, is not one that a single other community uses, nor is it one that, that, that mirrors the, the construction that the state uses in terms of, of their language. And what the code enforcement's interest in doing, and wants to have a discussion with the planning board, whatever, is that we more, fall, more closely follow what every other community does 
in terms of the definition for the, uh, the normal high water line of coastal waters. And that way, you know, it, if we get litigated again, you know, there's a lot more case law in terms of, uh, <coughs> you know, how we can defend our position. Uh, whereas, you know, you know, and I knew even the, the, for the short time that I was the, the interim code enforcement officer, trying to go out and, you know, it's, it's one thing you can see at top of a bank, but it's another thing of trying to figure, is that an effect of a tide? Or is it, or is it just the, the natural, you know, bedrock that's been exposed because of the wind and other factors over the years? Uh, it, it's, not, it's not an easy judgment, and the way it is now, it's, it's just subject to so much interpretation uh, that, you know, it's, it's a litigator's dream on if you're trying to get something done or trying to stop something. Frank, you had a question? Yeah, I'm just curious. Does the ordinance provide for changes in the normal high water mark, given the fact that it's likely to change? Or is that another issue we'll have to deal with on a going forward basis? You, you, you're talking about the, the rise of the tides? Yeah. It, it, it really, it doesn't. As the ordinance now stands, it's the effect of the tides. If there's an observed effect of the tides, uh, then yeah, it, you know, it, it automatically changes. You don't, you don't need a definition change simply because of tides maybe being higher than they once were. <coughs> Any uh, questions? Okay. Yes, Jamie. I, I think there is a decent body of case law out there uh, interpreting, I don't know if it's state statute, but at least there's a lot of precedential case law that the law courts looked at having to do with mean high tide lines. Yes. Yes, and we've heard at our zoning board a lot of that yeah. in the last several months. So, And, and we ourselves had one significant case yeah. which, was, which was litigated in the, involving Trundy Point and uh, you know, which now, fortunately, the land trust owns, uh, as you're out with Mr. Colombo's, I think you get that name wrong, Coulomb's Coulomb. donation. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's still, it, it's that interpretation, <coughs> in my view, and some may disagree, it's the, the real challenge in our, our, our ordinance is the effect of the tides, whereas the state, the state definition, they've already mapped out, and it's, it's much more certain of where that line is, and, uh, Makes you know, sense. You know, I don't. You know, I don't want to prejudge what the planning board might do with it because I think there'll be a lot of public interest yeah. as this as this is reviewed. Any uh, further conversation? Yeah, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of <laughs> all the, unanimous. Thank you. Our second opportunity for uh, citizens who wish to address us on items not on the agenda. We have. No one who wishes to do that, so we, I'll entertain a motion on item number 49. Prior to doing that, though, I would like to mention that uh, our intention is when we go into executive session is to, to deal with the manager evaluation first, and then Michael will join us for the update on the police negotiations. And then um, after our executive session, we are planning to go into our finance committee meeting, which is open to the public, yep. which will be held in the joint conference room behind us. For those of you interested in weighing in on the first couple of rounds of our discussion on our 2014 budget. So item number 14, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. I so move. Do we need to read the exact wording? By law, you need to verbally cite the statute. Please? Okay. Wouldn't mind, Jessica. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, move that we go into executive session item number 49, 2013, for police negotiations and manager evaluation. In accordance with? In accordance with MRSA 4056A and D. I hear a second. Second uh, by Frank. All those in favor? Thank you. All right, so we'll be back. <laughs>